Good morning. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, our committee will be hearing proposed introductory bill number 1314A in relation to prohibiting discrimination based on one arrest record and other related matter. And uh, would be voted also for considered resolution recognizing January 27, 2020, as Holocaust Remembrance Day, and the week beginning on January 27, 2020, as a city-wide week of Holocaust education in New York City. Finding secure employment in a competitive uh, workplace is difficult at the best of time. Having a criminal record adds an additional barrier which has a raft of negative consequences, given that the people of color are disproportionately targeted for arrest. They bear a significant burden combating bias against those with criminal history. In 2015, the New York City Council mounted a significant effort to address this issue by enacting the Fair Chance Act. Under the legislation, New York City employees are prohibited from inquiring about a job application criminal history prior to making a conditional offer of employment. Similar ban the box laws, as they are commonly referred to, now exist in 35 states and 150 cities across the country. In New York City's law, is still considered to be one of the strongest examples. While we are proud of the positive impact this law has brought, there remain some gaps, and we see an opportunity to improve and strengthen the existing law. Currently, no protections exist for those who are employed and face criminal accusations and convictions. Further, those who have a pending adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, non-pending arrests and criminal accusations, and those with youthful offenders adjudications are not included under the City Fair Change Act. It is estimated that 70,400 misdemeanor charges in 2017 were adjourned contemplating dismissal. The vast majority of these cases were eventually dismissed, yet because of a lack of employment protection, attorneys often concern the client to plead guilty to avoid employment consequences. This is an unacceptable situation that both the state and the city are seeking to remedy. If enacted, Intro 1314A would therefore add the additional classification to the list of categories precluded from criminal history inquiry prior to conditional offer of employment. Lastly, 1314A aims to minimize the barriers to obtaining a license or permit by prohibiting, by prohibiting discrimination for minor violation and other non-criminal offenses. We hope that by implementing these changes, the Council can continue to strengthen the prote protection offered by our Fair Chance Act. We look forward to hearing feedback from the administration and stakeholders on how to achieve this end. We are also hearing and voting on a very important resolution to recognize Holocaust Remembrance Day. On November 1st, 2005, the United States General Assembly adopted a resolution to designate January 27 as International Day of Commemoration and Memory of the Victim of the Holocaust. This date represents the day that outwits Bert Keno one of the largest of the 40 concentration camps 
that comprised the outreach complex was finally liberated by assigning an International Day of Remembrance, the United, State, United Nation aims to reaffirm that the Holocaust, which results in a number of one-third of the Jewish people, along with countless members of other minorities, will forever be a warning to all people of the danger of hatred, bigotry, racism, and prejudice. Before we begin, I would like to mention the council members uh, who are here. We have Council Member John and member of the committee. And of, of also, we have Council Member uh, Dodge and a Public Advocate uh, Germany Williams. And both of them are, are, are sponsors of the different uh, legislation we're going to, one we're going to vote on and the other one we're going to have a hearing on. And I would like also to to thank uh, the members of the committee, the people who work very hard to make this, uh, this uh, uh, public hearing possible. I want to uh, thank uh, the committee staff also, Belki Mireg, Senior Counsel to the committee, Leah Skripek, Policy Analyst, and Nevin Singh, Financial Analyst, as well as my staff, David uh, Suarez. Um, now, uh, I think we're going to vote on the resolution, but before we do that, I will call Council Member Dodge, who is the sponsor of the resolution, to make a statement. Council Thank Member you. Dodge, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Uh, this resolution will, for the second year in a row, acknowledge International Holocaust Remembrance Day in New York City on January 27th. Additionally, it will establish a citywide week of Holocaust education, uh, urging educators and parents to broach the subject with the students and, uh, and children. Growing up as the son of Holocaust survivors, it was ingrained in my identity that my parents had lived through unimaginable horrors. Although, like many survivors that didn't even talk about specifics, uh, the experiences during the war had a significant impact on, on our family. Knowledge of the atrocities that my parents and millions of others suffered through just a generation ago is ever present in my mind. It is an extremely personal endeavor of mine to ensure that our children and our grandchildren and the future generations never forget what happened during the Holocaust. We all know the saying, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Baseless hatred, unfounded bias, and anti-Semitism were all factors in what eventually led to the genocide of six million Jews. One of the most frightening surveys to come out in the last year indicated that 66% of American millennials don't know what Auschwitz is. Furthermore, 31% believe that 2 million or fewer Jews were killed during the Holocaust, and 45% could not even name one concentration camp. This certainly indicates that we have our work cut out for us. As the generation that lived through the war is dwindling, it is more important than ever that we face this crisis head on, because it is indeed a crisis. In a time where we are seeing a rise in violent anti-Semitism and hate crimes throughout our city and across the world. We have a duty to ensure that young people are knowledgeable about the Holocaust. If we want to equip the next generation with the tools they need to fight bigotry and build a peaceful future, they need to educate them about the consequences of prejudice and mistreating others. We cannot afford to lose the memories of those who survived the Holocaust. We must never let the pain and loss that they suffered fade into nothingness. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Dodge. Thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, resolution. And I urge my colleagues uh, to vote yes on it. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Public Advocate Germany William to uh, present his comment on the, uh, the legislation the introduction on 1314A. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, greatly appreciate it. I'd also like to add my name uh, to uh, Councilmember Deutsch's resolution. 
Uh, and I want to thank uh, the uh, Chair and Committee on Civil and Human Rights for holding this hearing on the extending employment protections for individuals with criminal records through the passage of the Fair, Fair Chance Act 2.0. For the one in three Americans who have criminal and arrest records, criminal and arrest records, employment opportunities may be significantly diminished as employers have historically discriminated against individuals who are justice involved. This is especially true for individuals of more color who have been the victims of mass incarceration and overcriminalization. To address this disparity, I'm proud to have worked with the City Council to pass the nation's strongest ban the box policy to ensure that New Yorkers with an arrest or conviction record would have an equal opportunity to complete for the jobs. This legislation has decreased employment discrimination and created new opportunities for those who have criminal records. It has been five years since the passage of the Fair Chance Act, and it is time we expand the protections we provide to individuals with criminal records by closing some loopholes. Currently, banning the box does not protect individuals who have pending adjournments in contemplation of dismissals, or ACDs, non-pending arrests and criminal accusations, or unsealed violations such as loitering for the purposes of prostitution. The Fair Chance Act 2.0 prohibits the aforementioned violations of criminal charges from being considered during the hiring process and it extends protections from the original Fair Chance Act to individuals who are currently employed. I urge members of the committee to extend the reach of the Fair Chance Act for those seeking employment in New York City. Let's reduce barriers for justice involved individuals and create more equitable employment opportunities for those with criminal records. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. And just to clarify, this just extends uh, protections for those areas covered. And once again, uh, it uh, lasts until they are all, someone is offered a conditional uh, offer of employment, and then the research can begin. And what it does is allow someone to respond in case someone does not get a job solely on um, the uh, something that's justice of law, they can then respond to it. And it is now, and had been before this, illegal to discriminate against. Uh, but now we have a way to prove that discrimination, what often would happen uh, is people would give in their resumes and it would get thrown in the trash and you'd have no way to prove that it was discrimination. Uh, there are some uh, caveats here if, if there is a crime that's closely linked uh, to the job you're applying for. Uh, there are, you cannot force someone to hire uh, for that. There's protections uh, with sexual abuse. And this does not force anyone to hire anybody. Uh, all it does is provide an equitable and equal playing field for everyone. And uh, as was often uh, predicted, but not happening, uh, since the five years has passed, the sky has not fallen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Public Advocate Germany Williams. Thank you very much. Now we have been joined by Council Member Ernest Bowne. Thank you. I think now we can proceed to the votes. And I would like uh, to ask the clerk to call the roll, please. William Martin, Committee Clerk, Roll Call Vote Committee on Civil and Human Rights on Preconsidered Resolution. Chair Eugene. I vote aye. Barron. I vote aye. Drum. Are we voting on the resolution? Yes. Only? Yes. Okay. I vote aye, and I want to thank Councilmember Deutsch for introducing this and sort of making sure that we do not forget the um, terrible, terrible um, tragedy and probably the worst hate crime ever committed, which was the Holocaust. Thank you. And we have been joined also, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Clegg, by Councilmember Parkin. We are voting in a resolution to declare. Uh, to uh, the Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day in New York City. Council Member Perkins. We have voted four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Item has been adopted by the committee. Thank you, Mr. Clark, and I want to take the opportunity also to thank you for your service and uh, no uh, uh, public hearing, or especially this public hearing, wouldn't be possible also without your service and your contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I would like to call the first panel. I want to call, uh, oh, you are already here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I thank you for your participation, your presence, and everything that you are doing on behalf of the uh, New Yorkers. Thank you so much. We are with us, uh, Ms. Uh, Panya Susman who is uh, the Deputy Commissioner 
and the New York City Human Rights uh, Commission. Thank you very much. And also Zoe Chenitz, I believe, policy, uh, Senior Policy Council. You can, uh, would you please, uh, to the whole truth. Mm -hmm. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Eugene, uh, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing on intro 1314A. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. The Commission is proud to enforce one of the broadest and most protective laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of one's involvement in the criminal legal system, the Fair Chance Act. And we are excited to be here today to discuss intro 1314A, which would expand protections in meaningful and important ways for people currently employed or seeking employment and who have prior or current engagement with the criminal legal system. We think intro 1314A is vital to continuing this important work and we strongly support the bill. The Fair, Chance, the Fair Chance Act was signed into law in June 2015 and went into effect in October of that year. It was one of the first substantive changes to the New York City human rights law under Commissioner Carmelin P. Malalas' tenure and a groundbreaking shift in how employers must advertise, interview, and consider candidates for employment. By quote unquote banning the box, which refers to removing the box an applicant is required to check on an application indicating whether they have a criminal record, prohibiting the use of criminal background checks until a conditional offer is made, and then providing a standard notice and process for withdrawing the conditional offer under limited circumstances. It gives people with criminal history access to employment in ways that had long been out of reach. And the implementation of New York City's Fair Chance Act, or FCA, provides a case study in how the commission, under Commissioner Malalas' leadership, undertook a comprehensive and multi-pronged approach that involved policy development and rulemaking, education and outreach, a public awareness campaign, and aggressive enforcement, including case resolutions that incorporate restorative justice principles. Leading up to the Fair Chance Act's effective date, the Commission published its second legal enforcement guidance, which provides clear and transparent information and examples as to how the Commission will enforce the FCA's protections, enumerating specific per se violations of the FCA, and published a template notice, for, a notice form for employers to use to share with applicants when undertaking the Fair Chance Act analysis. In addition, the Commission published fact sheets, a multilingual pamphlet, and frequently asked questions on its website that are responsive to questions the Commission receives from members of the public and employers. In 2017, the Commission, after notice and comment, promulgated rules codifying most of the legal enforcement guidance. The Fair Chance Act rules also established a new early resolution process in which the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau, in its discretion, can issue fines pursuant to a prescribed penalty schedule in an expedited manner where per se violations of the FCA are identified. This has allowed the Commission to manage its resources and build in efficiencies so that, so that the Commission can focus its efforts on high impact cases. The rules went into effect in August of 2017. To educate the public on this major expans expansion of legal protections, the Commission developed two Fair Chance Act focused workshops, which also covered prohibitions on, on obtaining and using applicants' credit history during the hiring process for two different audiences employers to understand their obligations, learn where to find resources, and obtain clear information on how to properly engage in the fair chance process, and one, for, and one workshop for job applicants, workers, and service providers who work with people with criminal legal involvement to understand their rights, how to report to the commission, and what remedies are available to them. The commission offered these workshops to community-based organizations, business associations, houses of worship, and to sister agencies. The Commission also hosted these free workshops at its five borough-based offices on a monthly or quarterly basis during the first three years after the law went into effect, and we continue to offer them regularly. Since 2015, the Commission has provided nearly 1,200 trainings on the Fair Chance Act across all five boroughs, including over 500 training on Rikers, trainings on, on Rikers, over 50 additional trainings in partnership with the, the Department of Correction, Probation, and NYCHA, and over 100 trainings to the New York State Department of Correction and the New York State Division of Parole. In total, the Commission has provided in-person live training on the Fair Chance Act to 44,000 New Yorkers since its passage in 2015. 
The Commission has also prioritized outreach and education to business entities to ensure they have the information and tools they need to comply with the Fair Chance Act and other requirements under the city human rights law. For example, the Commission has presented on the Fair Chance Act to the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, the Richmond County Black and Minority Chamber of Commerce, the United Neighborhoods Civic Association, and the Bucks Business Network on Staten Island. The Commission has also regularly presented to the management bar, the law firms that counsel large employers on compliance, and to various bar associations on this law and others. In addition, the Commission has educated millions of New Yorkers on their rights and obligations under the Fair Chance Act through a robust public outreach campaign that launched in late 2015 and included multilingual ads in subways, online, in newspapers, and on ethnic and community radio stations. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau has aggressively enforced the Fair Chance Act using a variety of, of investigatory tools and methods for maximum impact. Since 2015, the Commission has filed 456 complaints of criminal history discrimination, and as of, as of earlier this month, currently has 174 open matters related to the Fair Chance Act. The Commission has conducted a total of 832 tests related to the Fair Chance Act and filed a total of 69 Commission-initiated complaints that were a result of testing. And I will note that many of the amazing staff of the Commission who do this work every day are here today um, at the hearing, um, so wanted to give them a shout out. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau has resolved cases with large employers, including, for example, CityMD, Yelp, Mount Sinai Medical Systems, and CVS ensuring maximum impact for New Yorkers, and in some instances, has even negotiated resolutions that include a commitment to ban the box nationwide beyond what employers are legally obligated to do. In addition to major policy changes, trainings, and other affirmative relief, the Commission has ordered a total of, I'll, I'll narrow this up, um, over $1 million in damages and penalties since 2015, representing nearly $700,000 in damages directly to complainants that have been harmed by, by violations of the Fair Chance Act, and over $350,000 in civil penalties to the general fund of the City of New York. In other cases, the Commission, in its discretion, has not levied any penalties at all, where an employer agrees to take immediate action to correct a violation, undergo a training, and come into compliance. A few case summaries highlight the Law Enforcement Bureau's dedicated efforts to ensure widespread change, relief for victims of discrimination, and restoration for communities impacted by these practices. And I'll just highlight two cases in my testimony. In a case in which an individual sought a job as a custodian, the applicant identified that the application contained illegal questions about criminal history, and the applicant was unlawfully interrogated about his criminal history during his interview. Afterwards, he did not receive an offer for the position, and he filed a complaint with the commission alleging criminal history discrimination and violations of the FCA. To resolve the case, respondent agreed to bring its employment practices in line with the city human rights law, train the company's managers, partner with certain reentry organizations to include their, their clients who have criminal histories in the job applicant pool moving forward, pay the complainant $35,000 in emotional distress damages and $7,000 in back pay, and pay a $20,000 civil penalty to the general fund of the city of New York. In another case, an applicant for employment with Yelp filed a complaint alleging that the company made an unlawful pre-employment inquiry about his criminal conviction history in violation of the SCA and denied him employment based on that record. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau conducted an investigation and audited Yelp's employment policies. They found that Yelp had unlawfully run a background check on the complainant prior to making a conditional offer of employment and had unlawfully denied him employment based, um, because of a two-year-old misdemeanor conviction. Yelp, the complainant, and the Commission entered into an agreement requiring the, the, the company to pay $20,000 in emotional distress damages to the complainant, a $10,000 civil penalty to the general fund of the City of New York, and engage in extensive affirmative relief, including training, 800, training more than 800 New York City-based employees on the city human rights law, including the FCA, formally committing to ban the box at all of its offices nationwide, displaying the Commission's Notice of Rights and Fair Chance Act posters at conspicuous locations accessible to its New York City-based employees, and revising and updating its internal policies regarding applicants with criminal conviction hit records. In particular, in an unprecedented move beyond the protections of the existing law, Yelp agreed to disregard entire classes of convictions and, and convictions over a certain number of years old in, when they um, are screening and hiring for, for employment. I will turn it over to my colleague Zoe Chenix, Senior Policy Counsel, to discuss the key changes to the Fair Chance Act that Intro 1314A would codify. 
Thank you for convening today's hearing to discuss this incredibly important bill. The Commission is dedicated to using all the tools at our disposal to ensure that the Fair Chance, Fair Chance Act fulfills its promise to reduce barriers to employment for people with involvement in the criminal legal system, and we hope to incorporate the additional protections afforded by 1314A into the agency's work and mandate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Eugene, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing on 1314A. I'm Zoe Chenitz, Senior Policy Counsel at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. As my colleague Dana Sussman highlighted in her testimony, New York City's Fair Chance Act has been a leading model across the nation in terms of promoting fair employment opportunities for people impacted by the criminal legal system, ensuring they have an opportunity to obtain, obtain employment based on their merit and qualifications, to support themselves and their families, and to contribute meaningfully to their communities. The Commission strongly supports Intro 1314-A, which will strengthen the Fair Chance Act in several important ways. I would like to focus on four key changes that the bill will make to the New York City human rights law. First, the bill provides new procedural protections for job applicants and current employees with pending criminal cases, meaning that employers may not arbitrarily take adverse actions, such as denying or terminating employment, because of an arrest or open criminal case without first considering several factors related to whether the alleged wrongdoing is related to the job or would pose an unreasonable risk to people or property. This important change ensures that people who have not been convicted of a crime and are presumed innocent under the law will receive similar employment protections to those already available for someone convicted of a crime. Specifically, the bill requires that before an employer takes an adverse action against an applicant or employee based on a pending case, they must first request information from the person and consider six relevant fair chance factors that are similar to those outlined in Article 23A, Section 753 of the Correction Law. The differences from Article 23A reflect the fact that unlike old convictions which may have occurred in the distant past, pending cases concern current interactions with the criminal system. With respect to pending cases, the relevant fair chance factors would include one, the city's policy objective for, of overcoming stigma toward and unnecessary exclusion of people with criminal justice involvement from licensing and employment. Two, the specific duties and responsibilities related to the person's employment. Three, the bearing of the alleged criminal offense on the person's fitness or ability to perform the duties and responsibilities of the job. Four, the seriousness of the alleged offense. Five, the legitimate interest of the employer in protecting property and the safety and welfare of specific people or the general public. And six, if the person is a current employee, any additional information they can pro provide of rehabilitation or good conduct, including their history of positive job performance. Taking into account all of the relevant fair chance factors that I have just listed, the employer could take an adverse action only if they determine that there is a direct relationship between the job and the wrongdoing alleged in the pending case, or that granting or continuing the person's employment would involve an unreasonable risk to property or to the safety or welfare of specific people or the general public. As with the fair chance process that is already applicable to convictions, the employer will have to provide the applicant or employee with a copy of the criminal history information relied on by the employer and a written copy of the employer's analysis of the relevant fair chance factors, and then give the person time to respond, for example, with information about errors in the criminal history, faults in the employer's analysis, or with mitigating information. As with the existing protections for criminal history under the Fair Chance Act, these new protections based on pending cases would not apply to police officers, peace officers, or other positions at law enforcement agencies, or where the law imposes a mandatory forfeiture, disability, or bar to employment. In addition, the new protections for pending cases would not apply to public employees who are already eligible for procedural protections against arbitrary dismissals pursuant to Section 75 of the Civil Service Law or pursuant to agency rules or other law. The minority of public employees who are not eligible for such alternative protections and the majority of employees working in the private sector will gain protections under the proposed amendment to the Fair Chance Act. In the absence of employment protections for pending criminal cases, legally innocent people with pending criminal cases enjoy, paradoxically, less robust employment protections than people who have been convicted. As a result, people who wish to fight the criminal charges against them 
may risk greater job uncertainty while their case is open than they would if they plead guilty to quickly resolve their case. This bill would protect the rights of the accused and would help to mitigate collateral, collateral employment consequences, particularly for people of color and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people who are disproportionately impacted by the criminal legal system. Second, the bill would add protections for employees impacted by the criminal system during their employment. Currently, the Fair Chance Act only protects current employees from adverse action based on convictions that occurred prior to the start of their employment. Under the proposed amendment, current employees would also have protections against adverse actions based on a pending case, as I described earlier, or a conviction that occurs during employment. As with convictions predating employment, employers would have to engage in an analysis similar to that which I described earlier. In short, an employer could take an adverse action only after considering the relevant fair chance factors and determining either that there is a direct relationship between the uh, alleged or convicted conduct and the job, or that continued employment would involve an unreasonable risk to the safety or welfare of people or property. The employer would also be required to provide the employee with a written copy of its fair chance analysis along with the criminal history information on which the analysis was based and give the employee a reasonable time to respond. The employer would be permitted to place the employee on unpaid leave while it conducts the fair chance process. Consistent with existing exceptions to the Fair Chance Act, the bill's protections for current employees would not apply for police officers, peace officers, or other employees of law enforcement agencies, or to positions designated as exempt from the fair chance process by the Department for Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS. In addition, as I noted earlier, protections for pending cases would not apply where the employee is otherwise protected under Civil Service Law Section 75, agency rules, or another law. These procedural protections are important because they will prevent an arrest from automatically causing job loss while still protecting the legitimate business interests of employers. Third, the bill would prohibit employers from considering violations and non-criminal convictions that are unsealed. Currently, employers are prohibited from asking about or taking any adverse action based on violations or non-criminal convictions that have been sealed, a process that happens automatically after a period of time for most violations. However, there is no protection for workers with such adjudications during the period prior to sealing, which typically lasts between six months and one year, or if the violation is not subject to sealing, as is the case for the violation of loitering for the purposes of prostitution. In short, a loophole in the current law means that people whose criminal outcomes are deemed so inconsequential that they may not be considered at all once they are sealed have no employment protections before they seal. Intro 1314A would close the existing loophole, ensuring minor contact with the criminal legal system does not hinder the ability to seek and keep employment. This amendment will be particularly impactful for people convicted of loitering for purposes of prostitution, a violation that critics have referred to as walking while tra transgender because of the frequency with which it is used to disproportionately police transgender women of color, often criminalizing ordinary conduct such as standing on a street corner with one's friends. By adding employment protections for unsealed violations, which include all convictions for loitering for purposes of prostitution, this bill will help to reduce the collateral consequences of this outdated offense. This bill will provide similar new protections in the area of licensing with respect to unsealed violations, non-criminal offenses, and the underlying arrests that result in such outcomes. Fourth, the bill will provide procedural protections if an employer seeks to take adverse action based on perceived misrepresentations about a person's criminal history. If there is any perceived conflict between a person's self-report of their criminal history and a background check, the employer can currently take adverse action without any further input or clarification from the person. That is troubling because background checks often include inaccurate or outdated information. In addition, employers may use insignificant conflicts between what a person has represented and what appears on the record as a pretextual basis to reject them from a job. This bill would require that before an employer takes adverse action based on a perceived misrepresentation, they first provide the person with the information that they believe demonstrates the misrepresentation and provide the person a reasonable time to respond. In other words, 
The bill will enable people to explain their situation before an employer unilaterally takes an adverse action based on their belief that the applicant has lied about their criminal history. This change will be particularly helpful to people with old and minor convictions who may be less likely to remember them. For all the reasons I have discussed, the Commission strongly supports Intro 1314-A, and we encourage the Council to move forward with its passage. We are grateful to the public advocate for sponsoring this legislation and to Council for taking up the issue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, how many, my first question would be, how many complaints or inquiries does the Commission typically hear regarding discrimination based on someone criminal record? So in the um, year, th uh, let's say four and a half years since the, we've implemented the Fair Chance Act, we filed 456 complaints. 465? 56, 456 complaints. In the past four years, you say that? Four and a half years or so since five the um, effective date. And do you have uh, the data in terms of uh, ethnicity, gender, I mean, you know, Sure. We, we typically don't it? track uh, demographic data um, other than when it's related to a protected class that an individual is alleging um, for privacy reasons um, and, and other reasons. Um, but so I couldn't tell you today what the demographic data is or the, the breakdown by race or gender um, of those 456 complaints. But in your report, you, should, you, you, you have, you know, the classification according to ethnicity and gender. You do have that for your own record, right? We have protected classes, certainly, based on national origin and race and color and gender um, under the city human rights law. OK. So if I can add just a little bit, um, if, a, if a complaint were to allege uh, discrimination based on one of those additional protected categories, um, that would be uh, reflected in, our, in the data that we do track, but we don't um, generally keep all demographic data about um, anyone who has filed a complaint. Can you speak a little bit more about the type of complaint that you receive? What type of complaint? What, what exactly do people complain about? Sure. So I think, um, again, the, I will, I'm able to provide some anecdotal information because we are not um, engaged deeply with our law enforcement bureau every single day. But from what I know of how our cases come in, um, I think a lot of our work early on after the implementation of the Fair Chance Act um, involved ensuring that employers' advertisements, job applications, and processes were compliant with the Fair Chance Act. Um, a lot of what we were seeing were um, explicit per se violations of the of the city human rights law and the Fair Chance Act, and we created an entire process to expedite and address those um, cases. So job ads that continued to say background check required, no felons, no criminal history, no criminal record. Um, job applications that continued to have a box that you had to check if you had a criminal history, um, and so we. Uh, worked quickly to resolve, to educate employers and to resolve those cases. Um, I, we continue to receive those kinds of cases today, um, but I think that we are also do, working on cases that involve um, the, the analysis, the Fair Chance Act process and the analysis that employers have to undertake once they've under, once they've extended a conditional offer and to ensure that they're following that protocol properly and they're weighing the factors appropriately. Um, and then I think you asked about sort of like what kinds of cases or industries that we see. Um, so uh, anecdotally, again, we about half of those cases are filed against um, retail or sort of customer service type respondents. Um, and then uh, another large proportion of our cases involve restaurant, food service, delivery, and warehouse type jobs. Mm -hmm. 
Can you walk us through the uh, action of the Human Rights Commission when you receive those uh, complaints? What exactly, what is the process? What is the first thing that you do? And also, what is the result you have uh, had, especially for the 465 cases that you were working on? So that means when you receive a complaint, what, the, what is the first thing that you do? Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you handle those complaints? How did the, how do we handle and, and you're asking for the how those cases resolved as well? Yeah. Okay, so the process, um, it, it depends. There's a few different ways that a case could go. In a typical case, like the ones that I identified um, in my testimony, uh, an individual would, would likely either submit a form on our website um, saying that they think that they've face discrimination on the basis of criminal history, or they would call 311 and access the commission that way. Either way, we would call them back and we would have a human rights specialist conduct an intake over the phone for about 10 minutes to assess if we have jurisdiction to investigate their claims. So that would require, did this happen in New York City? Did it happen within the past year? Um, was it an employer generally that would be covered? So typically it, you would need four or more employees, but we would, we, if, if the person doesn't know, we would obviously have them come in and we would assess the case um, in person. The next step would be um, the individual would come in for a full intake with one of our attorneys who would sit down with them, go through what, their, what they experienced, draft a complaint, and um, re have that individual review the complaint and sign it. That complaint would then be delivered to the respondent, the employer that conduct that engaged in the violation of the city human rights law. Um, and from there, the respondent has an opportunity to respond and answer the complaint. Um, then there's an opportunity for the complainant to respond to that answer. And there's a bit of a back and forth over um, the allegations in the complaint. From there, um, the case goes into invest it, the investigation. So the commission would request information, documents, could interview witnesses, review policies, um, would further interview the complainant or other people um, involved, and could potentially expand the investigation so that we are looking not only at this particular incident, but if we identify that policies are not in compliance, we would take, we would review, we would do a full audit of the employer's policies. Um, and then the case could resolve, it could settle um, at any point in this process where the, where the respondent comes forward and says, listen, we, we, are, we want to change our policies, we'll do the training, we understand that we violated the law, um, and our attorneys who are investigating the case can, can conciliate, which means it's sort of a three-party case resolution. The law enforcement bureau of the commission, the complainant, and the respondent um, join in a conciliation agreement where we would order training, um, policy change, Potentially, we would monitor the employer for a period of time to ensure that they're compliant with the law and they would have to report back to us. They might have to um, specifically send job advertisements to community-based organizations that work with people with criminal legal involvement so that they are recruiting from a pool of people that they had previously excluded. Um, there might be emotional distress damages or back pay paid to the complainant um, and civil penalties that the respondent could pay to the city of New York. Where it's a small, um, small respondent with few resources, and we learn that there's a violation of the city human rights law, one of the approaches that this commissioner has taken is to call them up, send a letter, say, we've identified that this is a violation of the city human rights law, come into compliance right away, and there will be no civil penalties, there will be no lengthy investigation or litigation. Um, you have to undergo tr free training that we provide. Um, post a notice of rights in your workplace and uh, change your policies. And so we will resolve cases that way in order when we have respondents who might not have been aware of the law, might not have the resources to get educated on the law and are willing to resolve the cases um, more quickly. Um, in addition, we have a pre-complaint intervention unit that's um, a relatively new um, unit within our law enforcement bureau that does the work to bring respondents in, into compliance and to do some initial advocacy um, before a complaint is ever filed. And that is an effort, again, to um, move cases more quickly, to resolve cases that might not need a complaint to be filed and a lengthy investigation 
particularly where we know that there is an, a, a clear violation, um, either because it's in print in a job ad or in a job application. Um, I'll stop there, that's a lot of information, but um, uh, I think you had also asked about how those cases have resolved. So I mentioned that 174 are currently still open. Um, of the closed cases, we had nearly 80 resolve as um, settlements. Um, we had 199 close for administrative um, closure. Um, we had six that were, um, we found no probable cause. Uh, we had one withdrawal. Um, which an, a, a party, a complainant can withdraw at any moment. Um, and so I believe those are where are those 456 cases currently resolve. And then the one other thing I'll add is that we've intervened in 47 matters successfully in a pre-complaint posture, um, which means that we were able to resolve the matter without ever filing a complaint. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you said that there, there, there are still 100, uh, uh, if I'm wrong, please uh, give me the exact number. There are approximately 174 cases still open. So why those cases are open? So those cases involve complaints that could have been filed last month or six months ago. Um, so those, in, those could be cases, those are probably likely to be the more recent cases that remain open. It's not that 456 cases were filed on the effective date in 2015, and some of those still remain open. This is sort of a rolling process, so people can walk in to the commission today and file a case, and so that would count as one of our open cases. If there's a case that is not under your jurisdiction, what, is the, what do you do? You drop it or you refer, you, you collaborate with the state or federal department? What happened if you are not capable of handling this case because of the legislature, the law and stuff like that. What is the next step? What do you do with that case? Um, so typically, um, the, you know, New York State has had long-standing protections um, under New York State law and expanded their protections uh, last year. So we can refer cases to our counterparts um, within New York State government um, to take up cases. And we also, if there are, uh, if, if, the juris if our jurisdiction is limited because of a statute of limitations issue um, and the individual may have a claim that they could pursue in state court, we often refer cases to uh, legal service providers who are experts in this area of the law um, who could represent the individual in a, potentially in a state court proceeding. Um, so we do refer, we have an extensive referral network um, where our, our info line staff and our um, frontline attorneys are referring cases to partner organizations um, if, they, if we don't have jurisdiction to investigate them. When you refer the cases to your partner organizations, let's say in this state, is there any follow-up? to find out what is the result, what is the outcome of the work that the state is doing? I, we don't have a formalized process for learning how cases resolve um, when we've referred them. Informally, though, we have pretty direct lines of communication to many of our uh, community-based uh, service providers and legal service providers so that we kind of have an ongoing feedback loop around the cases that we are investigating, the cases that they have, how the case law is developing, um, opportunities to work together. Um, you know, a lot of that has informed our work and our, and our thinking around th these new, this new proposed amendment. Um, so we don't have a formalized process of, in, of learning where the, how the cases resolve, but we are in regular communication with a lot of, our, a lot of the key stakeholders on this specific issue. We know that you know, in New York City, it is very difficult for people especially hardworking people, immigrant people, or anybody, even the person is educated or aware of the system, some of the time, depending on the case, it's very difficult to navigate through the system and get the, the result that the person is looking for. And I'm talking about in New York City. So that means in the state, it can be more difficult for somebody who's living in New York City, somebody who doesn't have a clue how to handle cases with the state of New York. Do you have in place something to continue to assist that person, to reach out to that person, say, hey, how is your case? Did the state contact you? What is the issue? Is there something that I can assist you with? Do you do that usually, or you just the communication with the, the person who, who uh, bring the complaint to you just stop when you refer the, 
the, the, the, the, the person to the state, what happened? I'm talking about your communication, the communi communication of the, the New York City Commission of, with these uh, New Yorkers who is uh, looking for a result, for, for some assistance. What type of assistance that you continue to provide to that person who is dealing now with the state? Um, so I think our ability to continue to follow up with individuals who have cases that potentially are pending at other agencies is challenging for us. We have limited resources and, and an ever-expanding mandate. Um, but I think, and, and I also would flag that we can't, um, we don't share information about the status of our investigations with people who are not representing, formally representing as the attorney um, parties to a case. So if someone from the state, for example, were to ask me what the status of a case is that, we, that they referred to us, we wouldn't really be able to share that information um, because we don't share information about open investigations. Um, so they would, I, I imagine, likely do the same. Um, and while we, we continue to prioritize the cases that are coming directly to us to ensure that we are getting back to people quickly, we are processing and moving cases quickly and investigating cases thoroughly. So we do not, as far as I'm aware, um, have, a, again, a formalized process of checking in on how cases have moved through um, other agencies. However, I will say that we have good partnerships with our counterparts at the state level. Um, and so if there is ever someone who may reach out, reach back out to us and say, I know you referred me to you know, this, the state division and they haven't gotten back to me, um, we will absolutely um, move through the process and make sure that they're getting um, connected to the right people. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add to what my colleague has said is that um, particularly with the uh, prospective passage of this bill, uh, New York City will have the most extensive jurisdiction for protections for folks with criminal system involvement. Um, so it's very unlikely that, at least for folks who live within New York City, um, that we would have the need to refer them out to the State Division on Human Rights. Um, so the limitations would be jurisdictional to, to, for example, whether you are in New York City or outside the statute of limitations, which my <coughs> understanding is comparable for the state um, and for the city. I don't understand what you said, but what I'm trying to understand is that somebody in, in New Yorker, somebody who's living in New York, and the Human Rights Commission from New York City is the organization, you know, normally that should provide to New Yorkers assistance in trying to resolve the discrimination case or any type of challenges that they are facing in terms of discrimination in ter for jobs because of the criminal background, right? So you mentioned that you refer those people in case they are not under your jurisdiction. I do understand that you refer them to the state, but I know that it is not easy for somebody who is living in New York City to deal with the state. It's very difficult. So. Uh, you are not trying to interfere in the, you know, the, 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 the system of the state. This is not what I'm saying. So while the person in New York City is trying to get a resolve or to resolve the case, so I think that some assistance may be provided to that person in New York City in order for that person to be aware of certain, certain situation or, or, or if the person is in need of certain assistance, contacting those uh, agencies you know, from the state. Because you know, bureaucracy is very, very a big challenge for many people. The other thing I want to mention also is, I believe that when you refer somebody to the state, you don't refer that person to any organization. I believe that you refer that person to a governmental institution also that are entitled, that has the right to handle these type of cases. And when the person is referred to the state, I think the, 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 the branch, the governmental branch or institution or agency in the state has the right also to do investigation and to handle the situation. That's the reason why you refer that person to the state. And uh, uh, if they need some information on that case to be able to help the, the person I think they will contact the commission. And I don't think the, the commission will refuse, I don't know if I'm wrong, tell me, will refuse to give them 
the information that they need to resolve that case because they are also government, they are also fighting on behalf of the people to prevent the discrimination. I think they have the right under the law to do that. So I think that there should be a channel of communication not to violate the privacy of the client, but to work together to get the result that uh, the, the client or the New Yorker deserve. So when you say that uh, you, can, you won't release or you cannot release information about that person, I don't understand that because I think that the referral should go to official government institution that are under the law habilitated to resolve or to handle these type of cases. Can you clarify that for me? Sure, I'm happy to clarify. We can and we do work with our partner agencies both at the city level and at the state level to accept cases and to refer cases. What I was uh, mentioning is that once a case is under investigation, it is our practice not to disclose the status of an investigation. So we would not share you know, the details of a pending open investigation with anyone who is not a party to that case. So the complainant, the complainant's counsel, the respondent, the respondent's counsel. That is a practice that we, um, that we do because our investigations are not public. They're not filed on an open docket available to, yeah, um, to, to the public. So if someone were to inquire what is the status of this specific case, okay. we cannot share that sp the status of a specific case. But what we certainly can do is let our counterparts at the state division know we received that case and it's with us and we're handling it. Or we've sent you a case. Can you make sure that it's, you know, it's been um, connected to the right people in your office? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in your statement, you mentioned that uh, certain cases are still open, and you did, you did mention also something about resources. You have certain challenges, and because of the resources, uh, probably you are not uh, in the position to close all those cases or to handle all those cases. And I'm going back also to my question and the question of my colleagues from the previous uh, uh, public hearing. Do you have enough resources? Does the commission have enough resources to handle all those cases and to do the job that they want to do? I know that it is not easy. And I mentioned that to the mayor during the uh, budget uh, presentation briefing. I think it was last week. I do believe that you may need some more funding. Let me put it very straight because this is a lot of work and we have more work than before. Because of the outreach that the commission, I, I commend you for that and I thank you for that. You are doing a lot of outreach. I've been in certain uh, events and I see you are trying to reach out to people to inform them about their right and their obligation, that's wonderful. But when you do that, that increases also the number of people who are going to reach out to you. And that's when you're going to have more work to do. You cannot do the additional work with the same resources. So you don't have to answer me now because I try several times, I never get an answer. But I will come back with that answer at the time of the budget hearing. I do believe that uh, when we talk about the open cases and all the challenges that you are facing, I think the resources should be uh, 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 taken into consideration also. You don't have to answer me now, but if you want, could you tell me if uh, among the challenges that you, you're facing to resolve those cases or to close those cases, is the resources or funding is part of it? Um, you're familiar with our answers to these questions. <laughs> um, certainly, I, I, will, I will emphasize that we um, are enforcing an ever-expanding law, um, which we welcome. We welcome, um, the, we welcome this expansion of the Fair Chance Act. We think it's incredibly important. Um, with these expanding protections, you know, as New York City is often on the front line uh, and, and one of the first in the nation to expand protections in, in new areas, um, there comes um, additional cases um, and additional, frankly, responsibility for us to educate people about what their rights are and to educate 
uh, resp uh, potential respondents about what their obligations are under the city human rights law. So that is always a challenge as we implement new protections. We want to do them justice and do New Yorkers justice so that they know what their rights and their obligations are. Um, on this specifically, we have a really good foundation on which to build. Um, our Fair Chance Act implementation is one of, I, as I mentioned in, our in the testimony, sort of a standard bearer for us as to how uh, committed the commission was and continues to be to implement the protections of the Fair Chance Act. And so we've, we've issued legal enforcement guidance, we underwent rulemaking, we, we um, created new staff positions and brought in experts on the Fair Chance Act and experts with people working with um, people with criminal um, legal involvement. Um, and so we think we're in a good position to incorporate these new protections. It will take a lot of work and a lot of resources, but we're, we're committing um, you know, on the record to put those resources, um, the existing resources that we have to um, effectively implement, uh, implement this, these new protections if they were to pass. And thank you. I'm going to call on my colleagues uh, to, for some questions, but before that, let me ask you one more question. You mentioned that you know, certain cases have been resolved. Could you tell us how long those cases uh, uh, took uh, to be resolved? How long it, yeah. Sure. Unfortunately, I don't have the breakdown of that of the average length of a case right now. What we do know is that they were filed after the effective date in 2015 and were resolved um, before this before the hearing today. So, um, but I can um, we can look at the case resolutions and map out um, an average length of um, of how long they took to resolve. If that would be useful. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Bowen, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. We know that New York City has a horrible record of arrests, particularly of black and brown people, uh, because of the way that police conduct their behavior in our communities. So I'm particularly concerned about how we can address those issues. So this is a particularly interesting and impactful bill that we're considering. So we know that the First Chance Act is a procedural policy that's been implemented, and it lists those protected categories. And we're now looking to extend what those protections are. Do we know if there are people who are in these categories that we are proposing to be extended who were, in fact, not allowed to go forward with their case because when they brought their case, it was not a part of these protections. Do we have any idea of the number of people who were turned away because they said, oh, we're sorry, it's not included in this category? Um, thank you for the question. I don't think we have specific numbers, but I can, in very broad strokes, um, give you a sense of, of what we think might be indicative of the scope of impact of the bill. So. Um, Recently, um, you know, on an annual basis, the courts in New York City are um, each year closing a proc you know, some north of 20,000 uh, cases a year. And for criminal cases, I mean, it depends on how quickly charges might be dismissed. Um, but resolution can be anything from days for a very quick dismissal, um, months for more simple cases to a, a little more than a year mm -hmm. um, as the median time frame. So there's a large number of cases that for some period of up to about a year um, will be open. Um, and for those folks, uh, for their pending case, there, there currently is no protection um, for their current jobs or for their job applications. So it's a very, very rough um, sketch of, of what the scope of impact might be, but I hope it gives you a, some sense of it. Okay, thank you for that. I think you're talking about what we can expect going into the future, right? Is that what your question? But my question gets to the fact that someone who is in this new category may have come to you and, and brought their case to you and said, well, it was an ACD or I was a youthful offender. Do we have any idea of what that number might be? Yeah, again, I don't have specifics on, on how many folks have in the past been turned away, but I can tell you that the 
uh, impetus for filling in all of these loopholes is um, reflective of the experience of our law enforcement okay. bureau and of advocates that we have existing relationships with in terms of what their clients or the members of the public who are coming to us um, with cases that we couldn't adequately address or the law didn't adequately address. Um, okay. If I could add just one little clarifying um, point. I did just want to speak to um, adjournments in contemplation of dismissal or ACDs as you referred to. Um, so those actually are uh, now covered under the city human rights law and that is because of the fact that the city has incorporated by reference um, into a provision of the law uh, state protections and um, effective as of July 11th last year, um, there was an amendment to the state law that we incorporate um, that did add protections for ACDs. So a very, uh, I think the original version of the bill that was introduced by the public advocate um, did speak directly to ACDs, but in the interim, in the time um, <coughs> from when it was introduced to this hearing, um, those protections have already been added to the law, which is very significant. And, and what are the qualifications of the persons who are conducting the investigations or coming to the resolutions? What are their qualifications? Um, at our staff at the Law Enforcement Bureau. Um, so uh, most of our investigations are conducted by attorneys. Um, so they are civil service title attorneys who um, we really prioritize hiring people who speak languages that the you know, community members speak so that we speak now over 30 languages at the commission. I think we're creeping up to about 35 languages at the commission. Um, we prioritize hiring people who have direct service um, experience, so working at, uh, as a public defender, working at um, a legal services organization, um, working in housing court, um, in the employment bar, representing workers um, in other contexts. Um, most of our attorneys come with a civil rights background, or if they don't have a professional background in civil rights, a real passion for civil and human rights. Um, and so they are uh, attorneys who um, we think are highly qualified and dedicated to doing this work. Um, we also have, um, uh, when we were implementing the Fair Chance Act in 2015, we actually hired um, uh, Paul Keefe, who's here uh, right over my shoulder, um, who was um, at Community Service Society and had been a key member of sort of the advocacy team that, that really fought for the Fair Chance Act over many years um, and has extensive uh, work history working with people um, with, Chris, with criminal legal involvement um, in the employment space. So um, those are some of the, the qualifications in broad strokes. Thank you. The, for those persons who um, aren't offered a job and take the job and then get on the job but still feel that they are not treated adequately or fairly based on what it was that their criminal history uh, record had been, what recourse do they have? And how do they know what to do, where to go? Um, so so the, the law and, and this bill are drafted to address adverse actions in the broadest sense. So that can be things such as uh, failure to promote um, uh, or, other, or other conduct. Um, some of the procedure, procedural protections um, do sort of contemplate like a moment in time where the employer has learned about the, uh, for example, the pending case or, or the past conviction and then they're considering a job application. Um, but again, there, there is room for addressing broadly adverse actions. And would you direct them to the appropriate office to file those complaints? How would they know where they can go? Yeah, so I, I, I would hope that um, they, they know that they can come to the commission in terms of having protections. Again, the, the Fair Chance Act is, as you mentioned, the procedural protections, right, procedural. but there are also the, just broadly for certain categories of criminal system involvement, uh, protections against just discrimination. Um, okay. So, yeah, we, we're, we are there for people who have those sorts of claims. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Brown. Councilmember John, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, this issue um, is one that's of personal importance to me. When I was 16 years old, I was arrested for uh, loitering for the purposes of prostitution. Uh, that was 1972. Um, I was 16 years old and um, I was caught in a car with another guy 
and they ripped me out of the car, they pulled me into the precinct, they separated us, they kept coming in and out of the room and saying, you know, why were you with that guy, why were you with that guy? And then one officer suggested that um, maybe I did it for money. And I said, yeah, I did it for money because I thought that if I said I did it for money, it would be less of an impact than if I said I was actually gay. And um, that arrest record uh, and those types of arrests were very, very common uh, for men, gay men my age. Uh, and, and, and actually, it's, it's, it's still occurring here in the city of New York. As of 2009, a friend, Robert Pinter, was arrested for the purposes of loitering for, you know, for the, loitering for the purposes of prostitution as well. And he found out that it was a setup by the police. And finally, his record was expunged and everything. But it was really amazing to find out that even as of 2009, this was still going on here in the city. Um, but the purpose of me saying this is because it haunted me throughout my career. So um, when I um, first got out of college, um, I applied to um, get a job in an insurance company right down here, as a matter of fact, and they had to bond you. And so when they were in the bonding, they would ask you, um, you know, have you ever been arrested? And, um, and then they would say, oh, have you ever been arrested on morals charges? And I actually lied, and I said no, because I was so afraid to answer yes. But I cut out at lunch, and I never went back to that job again. That was on the first day. So then I went um, you know, to apply to the Department of Education for a job. And um, I didn't lie on the application, thank goodness. Um, but um, then I was called down by the Board of Examiners to, because they did the fingerprint check on me. And I had to sit and explain to three Board of Examiners people what the charges were about and why it happened. Uh, then uh, when I was running for city council, I had a daily news reporter um, try to track down the information. Um, and then I had to go on New York One News and explain the whole situation to them. So um, it's always been something that's been with me. And, and, and by, the way, the, by the way, the case was never sealed, as it should have been. Um, you know, and it was never really handled properly. Uh, the attorney that we had, because we were very, very poor when I was younger, uh, did a pro bono, and I don't know if he ever did it right. And I don't even really fully 100% remember exactly what happened because of the age that I was at the time that it happened. Um, so it really can have an impact on people's lives. Fortunately for me, I kept fighting. And thank goodness I had a mother who was there with me, and she kept fighting it. But Nevertheless, um, not everybody would be willing to do that or to go through it, or would they say, gee, I should go for a career where I got to get a teaching license or whatever, um, because they would just give up and be discouraged, thinking that they would never be able to, to be able to do that. Um, so I think it's really important, especially as it relates to LGBT people, not just transgender people, but LGBT people, especially men my age, because these charges were thrown around all the time. And uh, they've never really been cleared. I've asked the governor uh, in letter to um, you know, expunge uh, folks like me in my age group uh, of their record if that, in fact, happened to them back in the 1970s. The governor has not responded. I didn't expect him actually to do that. But um, so that's why having a law like this, I think, is so really important, because we need to prevent this type of discrimination. Um, and I just really wanted to say that I hope we pass this very quickly. Um, and, and I just think it's important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilmember John. Thank you. Let me uh, thank Ms. Dana Sussman and also Zoe Kenitz, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to thank you also for what you are doing with your colleagues uh, from the Commission. This is, I know, this is a uh, a uh, wonderful job, but uh, a job that uh, requires also a lot of partners, a lot of assistance, and a lot of resources too. So we will talk about that next time. And I just want to ensure you that we in the City Council, we are your partners, and all of us council members, we are your partners, and we're working together, and we will try to do everything that we can do to support you in the job that you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. We council. appreciate your support. Thank you. This is going right. So we're going to call the next panel. I think is uh, excuse me if I pronounce your name wrong, but I think that this is Eric and Gold, Christopher McNevick, 
Okay, Christopher, thank you very much. <laughs> I was close. Emily Porter Williams. Melissa Alder. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, I don't like to do that. For the sake of time, we will have to limit the, your presentation for three minutes. Okay? Thank you very much. Now, uh, any one of you can start any time, but please state your name for the record. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Eingold. I'm a staff attorney at Youth Represent. Um, thank you, Chair Eugene, uh, and to the committee members and staff for the opportunity to testify today. And even though he's not here, um, the leadership of Public Advocate Williams. Um, youth Represent provides holistic reentry legal services for court involved youth. Our mission is to ensure that people affected by the criminal justice system are afforded every mission, uh, sorry, every opportunity to reclaim lives of dignity, self fulfillment, and engagement in their communities. We provide criminal and civil reentry legal representation to young people aged 24 and under who are involved in the criminal justice system or who are experiencing legal problems because of past involvement in the criminal justice system. Of course, criminal records-based employment discrimination is one of the highest hurdles that our clients face when getting back on their feet after experiencing the criminal justice system. Uh, I would echo the comments from um, the Commission on Human Rights on the importance of expanding protections for people with pending arrests. And in my testimony, uh, I'll focus on um, the intentional misrepresentation issue um, that the uh, members of the commission also spoke about. One of the most common cases we see at Youth Represent is one where an employer alleges a client has intentionally misrepresented their criminal record. One case that comes to mind is a client who applied for a job and disclosed a felony conviction that resulted in him serving time upstate but forgot to list the low-level Class B marijuana misdemeanor that he, pleaded guilty to, uh, that he pleaded guilty to on his first court appearance. Our client's job offer was immediately revoked because the, client alleged that, uh, because the employer alleged that our client had intentionally misrepresented um, his record. I think it's really important that the committee, um, in, before passing the proposed amendments, adds the word intentional back into misrepresentation as it's written in the amendment to Section 10107G. I think the impact of that is that it could uh, limit, it, it will create a, an easier bar for employers to arbitrarily deny employment to people on the basis of a misrepresentation. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Christopher McNerney, and I'm an attorney with the law firm of Outton and Golden. Thank you to the committee for holding this hearing and for providing the opportunity to testify. For over a decade, Outen and Golden has been in the trenches, advocating on behalf of individuals unfairly denied employment because of their criminal history, and working to chip away at the steep barriers to reentry faced by individuals with records. Our firm has litigated numerous class actions brought under New York laws specifically protecting against discrimination on the basis of criminal history, and it's for that reason that we're submitting testimony today. 
I'd like to echo my colleague and skip to what we also view as one of the most important issues here, the issue of intentional met misrepresentation. This is an employer defense that is deeply troubling because in our experience, an employer typically will not make any effort at all to determine whether an applicant truly misrepresented their criminal history. Rather, the employer will simply compare the information an applicant self-disclosed to the information in the background check, and if it does not perfectly match, will make a determination of intentional misrepresentation. And the reality of applicant experiences is very much different, and there are many reasons why an applicant may fail to fully disclose criminal history outside of a supposed desire to mislead the employer. Thus, this inference of intentionality that employers argue is derived simply by comparing what an applicant self-disclosed to what a background check revealed is, in our view, very problematic. Some of the examples which the, the Commission also raised, but just to uh, um, touch briefly on, are individuals may not realize that, um, that they actually were convicted of the crime that they pled. They may misremember their older convictions. They may fail to understand the differences between felonies, misdemeanors, or violations. There may be many other reasons, and the employer's actual form asking you to disclose your conviction. It may ask you to go back for your entire history of your entire life, and it may use incredibly confusing information. And this is because employers know that if they can deny you the job for a, a falsification, then the, the Fair Chance Act does not apply. But if they actually do a fair evaluation, um, they have to actually go through the provisions of the Fair Chance Act. So I'd like to just finish by echoing my colleague by saying it's, we view it as vital to put intentionality back into the, the provision. We also provided in our comments some other suggestions of how um, this, this important issue might be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name good morning. is Emily Ponder Williams. I am the managing attorney of the civil defense practice at Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem, and I want to thank the committee for hearing uh, this important issue today. I also want to state that I agree um, wholeheartedly with the issues raised by my colleagues here, and I want to speak a little more specifically about the importance of extending protections in the current Fair Chance Act to those with pending criminal charges. Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem is a community-based holistic public defense office that provides high-quality legal services to the residents of Northern Manhattan. As part of its holistic defense mission, NDS's civil practice provides, concurrently with our clients' criminal cases, consultations, advocacy, and legal representation to our clients who are facing the collateral consequences of an arrest or a conviction. As Councilmember Drum pointed out earlier, Often, the harshest sentence associated with an arrest is not a term of incarceration. It is the shadow of an arrest record that follows a person after a single touch with the criminal justice system and saddles them with consequences that linger long after they walk out of the criminal court. When it comes to employment, I want to stress that this sentence is all too often imposed even before the resolution of a case, and a mere arrest routinely results in job suspension, loss, and denial while charges are pending. As a result, NDS clients are forced to make a decision, enter a plea to invoke the employment protections of the city's current human rights law in order to regain their livelihood or exercise their right to contest the charges against them. For many NDS clients, these consequences are automatic, triggered by an arrest. For instance, information about a client's arrest is often transmitted directly to their employer by the city and state licensing and regulatory agencies as soon as it happens. And in many cases, it is the employer's practice uh, to automatically suspend our clients while charges are pending, despite the nature of those charges. Or a job hunt could be put on hold for months while clients assert their innocence in criminal court because open charges appear on a background check. For these clients, there is no such thing as innocent until proven guilty. The fact of a charge is enough to strip them of their ability to support themselves and their family. NDS applauds this committee for considering amendments to these bills that, this bill that would significantly expand protections for people like NDS's clients. Uh, in my written testimony, I suggest 
a few key changes that would provide even further uh, impact for those clients. And I uh, incorporate what my colleagues have uh, already spoken about and refer you to my written testimony. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Good morning, Council Member Eugene. Good morning. And thank you for the opportunity mm -hmm. to testify today. My name is Melissa Ader, and I am a staff attorney in the Worker Justice Project, which is an initiative of the Legal Aid Society's criminal defense practice. The Legal Aid Society is the primary public defender in New York City, and the Worker Justice Project is an initiative that fights employment discrimination faced by people living with criminal records in New York City. First, um, I want to thank uh, the, the committee, and I want to express the society's strong support for proposed intro number 1314A, which takes an important step to fix unjust inequities in New York City's current criminal record discrimination law. The bill will help give all New Yorkers a meaningful opportunity to work by providing important employment discrimination rights to people with pending criminal cases, convictions subsequent to the start of employment, and unsealed violations. Um, I also concur with my colleagues on this panel, and I, I especially concur with the testimony by Ms. Represent and Outman Golden regarding the need to put intentional into um, the law. But I would like to focus <coughs> my testimony on another incredibly important change that needs to happen to this bill if it is going to be effective. Specifically, I believe that a seemingly minor and unintentional change to a previously enacted Fair Chance Act exemption will do enormous damage to low-wage workers by removing the protections of the Fair Chance Act from many thousands of people who are currently protected by the Act. The issue that I'm focused on today is at proposed 8107-11A sub F sub 3. When the Fair Chance Act was enacted in 2015, the City Council created a narrow exemption for specific employer actions that were mandated by other background checks. The proposed bill, however, significantly broadens that exemption to cover all aspects of the hiring process for workers in industries with legally mandated background checks, even those employer actions that are not specifically mandated by a background check law. Most of my low-wage clients in the Worker Justice Project will be stripped of their Fair Chance Act rights if this language change is enacted. For example, one of my clients is a certified nurse aide she lives in Flatbush, and she has a misdemeanor record that is almost 20 years old. Her conviction record has been reviewed by several government agencies, and each government agency has advised private employers that she is cleared to work despite her conviction record. Under the narrow exemption currently in the Fair Chance Act, if a government agency tells an employer that my client is cleared to work pursuant to a background check law, but the employer still denies her the job because of the st stigma of her record, my client is currently protected by the Fair Chance Act. And indeed, I have secured multiple jobs for my client by informing employers that they violated the Fair Chance Act. However, if the City Council enacts the language in the proposed version of 8107-11A sub F sub 3, my client will lose all of her Fair Chance Act rights because she works in an industry with legally mandated background checks. I therefore request that the City Council either maintain the narrow exemption that currently exists in the Fair Chance Act or use language similar to that used by the federal EEOC, which I've included in my written testimony. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Uh, I have your written testimony. I guarantee I'm going over them because uh, I see that there are a lot of very precious and good information for us. And I thank you so very much for what you are doing on behalf of the people who are really facing th these type of challenges. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, now we are calling Sergio de la Parra or Pava. Thank you. Sheila Shida means? Okay. Thank you very much for your assistance. Esti Conor. Wash Karina Martinez Artonso. 
And again, uh, I want to thank you for your work and for your presentation also. But for the sake of time, we will have to uh, limit your presentation to three minutes. But I will read, we will go over your reading testimony. All right? Thank you so very much. Anyone can start. Please mention your name for the record. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Huascarina Martinez Alonso. This testimony is submitted on behalf of Legal Services in New York City. LSNYC welcomes the opportunity to provide commentary on this important addition to the legislation and is thankful um, for the invitation to make this submission. I'm going to uh, really summarize a lot of my points, but you have my written testimony mm -hmm. before you. Um, LSNYC is an anti-poverty organization that seeks justice for low-income New Yorkers. As one of the principal law firms for low-income people in New York City, Manhattan Legal Services, my employer, is a constituent corporation of LSNYC. Um, recognizing the need uh, to close the employment gap for low-income New Yorkers, we created the Barriers to Employment Project to improve the job prospects of all New Yorkers. Um, we are here today to testify as to our experiences representing numerous clients um, with the goal to further expand access and opportunities for gainful employment. Um, uh, while we know that uh, current federal, state, and city laws have expansive protections with regard um, to people with criminal convictions, um, 1314A is um, an important expansion to the law. Um, although the Fair Chance Act has increased many of our clients' ability to, keep, um, to get and keep jobs, our clients are still facing discrimination and employment based on their criminal history, protecting applicants by adding limitations to inquiries regarding pending arrests, adjournments, um, ACDs, um, and pre-sealed violations um, will greatly um, improve outcomes for the workforce. In addition to clarifying the scope of the law, um, 1314A would also um, add steps to the Fair Chance Act process requiring an employer to affirmatively request an applicant's or an employee's information relating to the F um, Fair Chance Act factors before um, an employer does their analysis. So in this way, it gives um, our clients two opportunities to put their best foot forth. Um, additionally, and it, it enables applicants and um, employees to better uh, be prepared to respond to the Fair Chance Act notice. In our experience, clients are very confused as to how to respond to these notices and often miss a very short time frame of three days to be able to answer. Given vulnerable New Yorkers' interactions with law enforcement, 1314 um, not only limits uh, criminal records discrimination, but also limits discrimination on the basis on race. Um, it's no secret that in New York City, black and Latino people are disproportionately policed and therefore disproportionately disadvantaged in terms of seeking employment. Um, there's a bunch of statistics in my written testimony that I'll spare you about today. Um, although New York City has protections for people with criminal conviction histories and employment, not all New Yorkers who interact with law enforcement, law enforcement are protected under these laws, which is why we're here today. Understanding the racial ramifications of policing and employment limitation on the basis of arrests um, are, and their um, beyond New Yorkers' ability to remain outside of the criminal justice system. Just because somebody wasn't convicted by law enforcement doesn't mean that they weren't convicted to poverty by their inability to get jobs. Black New Yorkers are still um, have the highest unemployment rate in New York City, and they're also disproportionately over police statistics, are also, which are also presented in my written testimony. Um, in practice, the consequences of policing in New York City means that unemployed, while unemployment rates have fallen, that's not the case for black um, men in New York City. Um, 1314 would continue to expand our present and future clients' abilities to meaningfully, oh, I'll just summarize briefly. Um, uh, youth in our city are already disproportionately targeted by police, but today you can stop similarly disproportionately disenfranchising stigma of their experiences by enabling New Yorkers to further expand opportunities for to acquire and preserve employment. Thank you for allowing us to present this testimony today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Esty Connor. Morning. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Community Service Society of New York, or CSS. The CSS legal department, along with our, ne our Next Door project, provides legal services, advocacy, and rap sheet services to New Yorkers who have had contact with the criminal punishment system. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Um, in my written testimony, I've provided detailed comments 
about CSS's support for intro 1314, as well as a few issues um, that CSS is concerned about or some corrections that need to be made. I have detailed those um, in my written testimony, so during my oral testimony today, I'll highlight just a few issues that are particularly important to CSS and our clients. Uh, first, I would like to state that CSS strongly supports intro 1314 in general. We strongly support the, expansion, the expansion of employment protections being provided to New Yorkers who have had contact with the criminal punishment system, especially protections provided to New Yorkers who have a pending arrest at the time of application for employment, New Yorkers who have a pending arrest or conviction during their time of employment, as well as New Yorkers who have uh, cases that have been adjourned in contemplation of dismissal, cases that have been sealed, and cases uh, that have been adjudicated as a youthful offender case. So CSS generally strongly supports the legislation, but I would like to echo some of the concerns that were raised during the previous panel by my colleagues at other advocacy organizations. First, on the issue regarding applicant misrepresentations, uh, CSS wholeheartedly echoes the concerns raised by my colleagues that it is important that the legislation be amended or corrected. We believe that there was an inadvertent error that left the word intentional out of the legislation. So every place where, they use, where the term misrepresentation is used, the term intentional should be added. Um, in addition, I'd also like to address a concern that CSS has with the fair chance factors that are included in the, in the proposed legislation. CSS supports the proposed legislation's application of fair chance factors to situations not addressed by correction law article 23A. But in situations where a pending arrest is involved, CSS suggests eliminating evidence of rehabilitation or good conduct as a, as a relevant fair chance factor. Our concern, with this, our, our concern regarding this issue is that employ, employee submissions and discussions with employers regarding evidence of rehabilitation or good conduct could involve employees providing statements to their employers regarding their pending case, the circumstances surrounding their arrest, or their self-perception of their own culpability in the relevant incident. That is problematic because it not only undermines the presumption of innocence afforded to individuals who have been accused of a crime, but it could result in employees making statements to their employers regarding their pending cases. So for that reason, we, we urge the council to be very cautious on this issue. What, on this issue, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Shelly Shimizu, and I'm a staff attorney in the Employment Law Unit at Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to thank the New York City Council Committee on Civil and Human Rights, particularly Chair Eugene, for the opportunity to testify today. BDS's employment practice provides legal representation and advocacy to people facing employment discrimination due to current or prior contact with the criminal justice system. We have represented numerous clients who have lost or have been completely excluded from employment opportunities due to current or prior criminal justice involvement. BDS supports intro 1314A, which would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to prohibiting discrimination based on one's arrest record, pending criminal accusations, or criminal convictions. Many BDS clients are suspended or terminated from their current employment merely because of an arrest. I would like to share one client's story today. Ms. H worked as a home health aide caring for elderly individuals, a position she held for nearly eight years. She was arrested while physically defending herself from a sibling. Although she did not have a prior criminal history, as a result of the arrest, Ms. H was suspended from her job without pay or benefits. At the time, she was the sole financial provider for her children. It took nearly two months for her case to resolve, and every day she worried about losing her home and providing for her children. No court ever found Ms. H guilty of a crime, but her story illustrates how a person's life can be thrown into turmoil without any finding of criminal culpability. It is also critical to mention that Ms. H is a woman of color, and as many have acknowledged here today, persons of color are disproportionately harmed by the collateral consequences of an arrest. Allowing the racial inequalities of our criminal justice system to permeate into the employment context further stifles economic opportunities for low-income communities of color. Removing these barriers to hiring, licensing, and continued employment will help ensure that New Yorkers who rely on employment income will not fall behind on rent, 
car payments, and countless other financial obligations solely because of favorably resolved com contact with the criminal justice system. Thank you for your time and consideration of my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sergio Dolopov. I'm the legal director at New York County Defender Services, a public defender office here in Manhattan. In that capacity, we represent about 15,000 clients a year, indigent people accused of crimes. Now, uh, to put all this in context, in, in 2018, New York City, the NYPD arrested about 250,000 people, and about 109,000, or 43 percent of those cases, resulted in either a disposition to a violation or an ACD. So we certainly support intro 1314, which would provide greater protection for that astounding number of people who, who do have um, these dispositions and find it adversely affecting their employment. I did want to take the opportunity to talk about um, a related um, area. Since we're talking about um, the need to protect people from employment discrimination, you know, for over two years, uh, New York has had um, its first ever ceiling statute, uh, Criminal Procedure Law 160.59, which went into effect on October 1st of 2017. This does give some people the ability um, to move the court for sealing of past convictions, um, which is obviously a critical matter that we find constantly interferes with our clients' um, employment possibilities. Um, the Office of Court Administration estimates that there's about 600,000 people currently eligible for relief under this statute, and yet they've received less than 1% of those in applications. Um, now, when the statute was passed, unfortunately, no resources were really devoted toward educating the public about this vital new right. Um, we at New York County Defender Services are very interested in spreading the word to our clients and to our client communities, but we need help in doing that. And I'm, and I'm asking that the City Council take this opportunity um, to provide some leadership in this area about getting the word out about this ceiling statute that is severely underutilized and that I think could go a long way towards uh, preventing the kind of employment discrimination that is the subject of today's hearing. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to highlight that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And to all of you, thank you so much for what you are doing, and thank you for your presentation also. Thank you. <clears throat> now we are calling... Uh, any uh, Geneva? Any? Thank you very much. And Jared uh, Trujillo? Thank you very much. You may start, please. please. Mention your name for the record. Hi, my name is Annie Garniva. Um, I am the Director of Communications and Member Services at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Eugene and the rest of the Council for having this hearing. Uh, New York City Employment and Training Coalition supports the workforce development community to ensure that every New Yorker has access to the skills, training, and education needed to thrive in the local economy and that every business is able to maintain a highly skilled workforce. With over 175 members who provide these kinds of social services, uh, we represent community-based organizations, educational institutions, and labor management organizations uh, who regularly support New Yorkers in their quest to get a strong career uh, and job opportunities. Today, NYCTC is here on behalf of our member organizations who provide career services to people with justice involvement. Those include STRIVE, the Osborne Association, Fortune Society, and many, many others. Approximately a quarter of, our cli of clients that access the workforce development system in the city have been impacted by the justice system in one way or another. Our members say that this is one of the largest barriers to employment faced by their clients, and making this legislation in 
increased investments in targeted programs and services for these New Yorkers all the more important. Our testament, testimony today will be brief and to the point. We're proud to support the legislation proposed by the public advocate as well as the council. Our members have made it clear to us that the Fair Chance Act, uh, which is the existing legislation, is an important aid to them in their efforts to help justice-involved individuals achieve gainful employment. They have told us that while the Fair Chance Act has been helpful in supporting individuals with convictions, the complexity of the justice system, the sheer volume of New Yorkers that have been impacted by it but not necessarily convicted, and the bias that exists towards anyone that has had any involvement with the system at any point in time means that this proposed expansion to cover all New Yorkers is critical in closing some loopholes for discrimination. As we said in our support for the Fair Chance Act, before it came in law, discrimination against New Yorkers on the basis of conviction is still discrimination, and our city should be working to help formerly incarcerated individuals find employment. Um, the same is true for justice-involved individuals that would be covered by this legislation um, with a variety of uh, pending cases and ADIs. In addition to offering le legal protection, passing this bill will also help businesses uh, find more qualified talent than they have in the past. Additionally, as several people have pointed out so far, based on our members' experience in supporting individuals with justice involvement, uh, we have found that the three-day window that people have referenced so far that um, was initially meant to be empowering to individuals, in fact, keeps them um, from accessing a lot of these jobs um, because oftentimes uh, individuals either do not have their documents ready to uh, hand over to an employer um, so we suggest that either that window of time be expanded or support services uh, be grown to uh, organizations to be able to help individuals prepare their documents prior to that moment in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Trujillo. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chairman Eugene, and to the entire committee uh, for allowing us to speak on this. My name is Jared Trujillo. I am the president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, UAW Local 2325. Uh, we're a union of about 1,500 people. We are, we're lawyers, uh, we're social workers, we're paralegals, we're other advocates, and we really do a lot of the public defense work and immigration work uh, and, and juvenile defense work uh, that really uplifts and elevates a lot of low-income folks in New York. Um, in addition, we're also a coalition member of the Decrim NY Coalition, which is a group of about 30 groups that works to empower and uplift and elevate sex workers. Um, a lot of folks today have already talked about all of the substantial benefits of intro, of intro 1314. Uh, I want to talk about specifically how it impact people that have unsealable violations for Penal Law 24037, which is loitering for the purpose of prostitution. Um, now, uh, Council Member Danny Drum uh, briefly spoke about how his uh, violation under 24037 has impacted his career, even though his violation is from the 1970s. Um, that's the case for a lot of people in New York. Penal Law 24037, while it has prostitution attached to the title, it's not a prostitution-related offense. It's not even found within the same part of the penal law as the other prostitution-related offenses. People arrested under 24037 are oftentimes just existing. They're 94% women of color, they're disproportionately transgender, or gender, gender non-conforming folks, and they're waiting, uh, they're smoking a cigarette, they're waiting for a friend outside of the club, uh, they're hailing down a cab. Oftentimes police look at how a woman is dressed or how a person is dressed in determining how, uh, who to arrest under the statute. In a 2016 legal aid lawsuit, to try to invalidate the statute, an officer admitted under deposition that he looked for women with Adam's apples when determining who to arrest under the statute. However, this is still, 24037 is still a violation, meaning that it's not even a misdemeanor. And yet, because it's unsealable, it can affect someone's ability to get a job for the rest of their lives. Um, this is deeply concerning, not uh, not only for people that weren't even involved in any prostitution-related activity, uh, but it's deeply concerning because the people that are often picked up for under this statute are the most marginalized folks that already have substantial barriers to entering the job market. And so um, intro, intro three, uh, 1314, because, uh, because of how it would enable people with unsealed violations to be treated, it would only help 
uh, them overcome some of those barriers. Additionally, people that actually, uh, sorry, that are involved in the sex trade, um, that want to leave the sex trade, uh, by preventing this barrier to them leaving, uh, that would only help them. And finally, I, I see my time is over. Um, I, I would also echo what other folks have talked about today. Um, as far as right now, while intro 1314 is incredibly important, it still would enable employers to inquire about the violation, and we're asking that, uh, that it be amended so they can't inquire either. Thank you. Thank you very much. To, thank you to both of you. But before you leave, I got only one question for Ms. Annie. Mm -hmm. I think that you stated that three days is too short to respond to an employer. Uh, how long it should be, according to, you know, to yourself? I, we have not discussed this with a member, so I don't know, but generally three days, um, people don't even, it's, they have to gather several documents. So um, I would say you should ask CBOs that have direct uh, contact with individuals and for how the Legal Aid Society has developed best practices to be able to uh, prepare documents in advance. So I would, not, I would not want to give a recommendation that isn't based on actual people on the ground who are having this experience. So we're happy to do that research for you, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. And thank you for what you're doing for the New Yorkers. Thank you. And to all of you here, thank you for your attendance. And thank you also for your interest on these uh, very, very important issues. And thank you for what you are doing through your organizations. I know that many of you, you are members of organizations and you are working, this is a, a teamwork, as a matter of fact. When we work on behalf of the New Yorkers, we should collaborate and unite and work together to make sure that we make New York City a better place for all. And I commend you for your work. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. God bless you. Thank you. With this, the meeting is adjourned.